I'd like to welcome each one of you to our devotional study today. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me if you would, to Luke chapter 18. And we've been looking at verses 18 through 30 the last few days. I'm not going to take time to recap here as we look at the story of the rich young ruler. I will reread the verses, but I'm not going to recap what I have said. I encourage you to go back to previous days, devotionals, and listen to them to get the context of this passage if you've not already listened to them. But uh, Jesus gives us a lesson, and we see the application here uh, in the verses that we're going to look at today. So in Luke chapter 18, verse 18, it says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? That none is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. So as we come into a passage here, we see uh, a man who was wrapped up in the things of this world. We see a man that had possessions uh, as his idol, and he was more concerned about those possessions than he was about what God thought or things of that nature. And we've seen the danger as we come through this of living for the things of this world, of sacrificing the eternal on the altar of the temporal. And this guy was guilty of having another God. That God was riches and he certainly did not love his neighbor as himself. And uh, it's interesting as Jesus gave some of the commandments that he never listed any of the commandments of man's relationship to God. You see, as you look at the Ten Commandments, you can really subdivide them into two classes. One is man's relationship with man, and the other one is man's relationship with God. And we see here the struggle that this man had with riches. Let me remind you of what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in verses 6 through 10, he says, But godliness with contentment is great, great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many riches. So here, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul warns about the love of money. And that's why, notice he doesn't say money is the root of all evil. He says the love of money. Friends, there are people who we would look at it as uh, maybe not having a whole lot as far as material possessions and money is concerned, but they're still driven by the love of money. You don't have to have money to love it, to live for it, the lust after it. And that's what Paul is reminding them of here. And as we come back into this passage in Luke chapter 14, we have seen here that this guy has come to Jesus desiring eternal life. We've seen the things that he looks at wrongly uh, in these verses. And then we see that Jesus concludes this passage but in verse uh, 24 by saying, when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through an, uh, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying very clearly here, he's not telling us, <coughs> and I want you to understand that he is not saying here that a rich man can be saved. 
He is telling us that it's difficult for a rich man to be saved. Now, it's no harder in that they are saved the exact same way that anybody else is saved, that they need to simply turn from their sin, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he is God manifest in the flesh, and, and that he is the only one that can save them from their sin, and they turn to him in salvation. But it's difficult for them to be saved in that, you know, they have a point where rich people have a tendency of trusting in their riches. They can buy anything that they want to buy. And sadly, some of them want to buy their way to heaven or they want to work their way to heaven. And friends, that is not how one is saved. And Jesus makes it very clear here that it's difficult for them to be saved because so many times what they want to do is they want to trust in their riches rather than trusting in the living God. Oh, friends, a rich man can be saved. But what he is saying here is he is reminding us of the simple truth of how easy it is to allow riches to hinder men from looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is only one way for anybody to be saved, and that is for them to look to the Lamb of God in faith, believing that he and he alone is the only one that can save them from sin. And riches so often hinder people from looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying in verses 24 and 25. He's not saying that it's impossible for rich people to be saved, but what he is saying is they need to get past looking at their own riches and thinking that they can buy their way to heaven or they can earn the merit with God. And he says, no, no, a rich person needs to be saved the exact same way that anybody else is saved. But many times those riches hinder them from looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the truth of the matter is, as we stop and think about this, any time that anyone is saved, it is a miracle. Praise God that God opens the eyes of the blind and he helps them to, first of all, see him for who he really is, that he is a holy God, separate from sin, that he opens our eyes and that he allows us to see ourselves for who we really are, that we are nothing like him, that we are sinful creatures, and that our sin has separated us from a holy God. And he helps us to see the truth of the gospel because, friends, Satan blinds the minds of those that do not believe. He seeks to blind the eyes of those that do not believe so that they will not see the truth of the gospel as 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 tell us. And praise God for the miracle of when the Holy Spirit of God turns that light switch of illumination on in our lives and allows us to see the truth of the gospel, allows us to see ourselves for who we really are. And we come to that place that we turn to him and him alone for salvation. Notice what the disciples say in verses 26 and 27. I like this. They say, and they that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, speaking of Jesus, catch this phrase. You might want to underline this in your Bible. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Oh, friends, that's not only true when it comes to salvation. And I've seen it take place many times when it comes to salvation. I've seen God save people that in the hearts and minds of people, even though in their theology they believe that anybody can be saved, yet by the way that they live their lives, it is obvious that they, you know, they look at certain people and say, oh, look at what they've done, look at where they are, they'll never be saved. And God works in their lives and, lives and saves them. Friends, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. But that's not only true when it comes to salvation, friends, it is true in any situation of life. God specializes in the impossible. And nothing is impossible with him. And praise God, may we rejoice in the goodness of God and may we rejoice in the ability of our God that nothing is impossible with him. And then notice in verses 29 and 30, like the Bible makes it very clear that there is a special reward for those who turn their back upon the world and follow the Lord Jesus Christ with every fiber of their being. Christian, let me ask you today, is that reward for you? If, if you were to enter into the presence of the Lord right now, would you have the reward that comes because you've turned your back on the world and you've completely followed the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, if that's not where you're at today, friends, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. How about you come to the place today that you say, I have decided 
to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, though no one joins me, still I will follow. I will follow him wholeheartedly. Friend, if you're listening today and you're not saved, what is hindering you from being saved? And what will it be worth if you spend eternity in hell? Oh, friend, today is the day of salvation. Have a great day.